Okay, uh, so, <laughs> hi, we start. We are gonna start, so welcome back everyone. Uh, so the first speaker of this afternoon is Akim Klaus. So he's gonna tell us about uh, prismatic homology, please. All right. So yeah, I'm gonna tell you about prismatic homology. So just, uh, to get some feeling for where this is coming from, remember that Ben, in his first talk this morning, told us about various instances of motivic filtrations on algebraic K-theory. And uh, prismatic cohomology basically comes out of a version of motivic filtrations at the prime. So if you have some kind of p-complete ring and you want to study k-theory of that, then uh, there is a version of motivic filtrations that uh, relates this to uh, prismatic cohomology. So this is based on comparing k-theory to something that works much better in uh, characteristic p, namely uh, tc. So there's this whole story of trace methods where we study k-theory by mapping to this other theory called TC. And I think Ben is going to talk about that a little bit more in later talks. But uh, let me quickly review kind of the main players. And so for a ring R, and I guess uh, I just want to think about commutative rings, but you can do this for non-commutative rings as well. Uh, topological Hochschild homology. Is given by computing something like Hochschild homology, but not in ordinary uh, rings over the integers, but really viewing R as a ring spectrum. So you can tensor R with its opposite. So that's the formula for non-commutative land. In, in commutative land, it of course doesn't matter whether you write R or R op. Uh, you can tensor it w with itself over the sphere to get something that's like a, s like a spectrum version of the enveloping algebra. And then uh, this acts on R in a way that somehow uh, encodes the fact that R is an RR bimodule. And you can form this kind of tensor product. And this behaves very nicely. So here's kind of the, the first and most important computation of this, which goes back to Böckstedt, which is that for a perfect FP algebra R. You now take the homotopy groups of PHH. Then this is kind of periodic. It's a copy of R in every uh, even non-negative degree. And in fact, as a ring, it's polynomial. So as a graded ring, the homotopy groups are really polynomial on a generator in degree two. So that's Hochschild homology. And uh, this has additional structure. So let me not forget to do this. Yes, very good. So the additional structure here is that PHHR carries an S1 action. And uh, this S1 action somehow comes from thinking about something like traces, or th there's a description in terms of uh, cyclic objects. But uh, this has some additional symmetry. And you can use this S1 action to build some refinements of this, namely what's called negative cyclic homology. So this is just 
the fixed points of this S1 action, homotopy fixed points, and then there's there's a, a version of fixed points that you can take, uh, namely the Tate construction, and that's called uh, TP of R. Um, the T stands for periodic because usually the state construction gives you something periodic, although uh, in this generality, uh, this isn't always periodic. This is inspired by, like, the, the version for usual Hochschild homology ends up always being periodic, and that's wha where the name comes from. Right. And uh, let's look at the homotopy fixed point and Tate spectral sequences, right? If you know in, in this Birkstedt case, what the homotopy groups of THH look like, you could try to determine the ones of TC minus and TP from that. And here's the homotopy fixed point spectral sequence for TC minus R. So in the case where R is a perfect FP algebra. And this is unfortunately not the grading that Ben confused us with this morning. Um, so this is going to be uh, SER grading. So uh, the total, like the homotopy groups of TC minus are going to be along these diagonals. In this column, you will have just the uh, homotopy groups of THH. And to the left, you will more generally have group cohomology of S1 with coefficients in that. And group cohomology of S1, that's like cohomology of CP infinity. So you get this picture where here you have like R, 0, R, 0, R, and so on. And then this somehow continues too periodic to the left. And over here, there's nothing, right? This is like group cohomology is always uh, concentrated to the left. So we, we have this kind of checkerboard pattern, or not really a checkerboard pattern. We have this, this thing where in every even degree we have a copy of R and everywhere else we have zeros. And let me zoom out a little bit and just draw dots wherever we have R and just omit the zeros altogether. So This is going to save us some time in a second. All of this is in even degrees. Just imagine this grid is like just uh, all the even pairs of degrees and there's like zeros between here. So this is our spectral sequence. And now the first thing you notice is, well, this completely degenerates, right? There's no space for any differential. Uh, because differentials always increase the total degree by one, and all of this is in even total degrees. So this degenerates, and now we may wonder what is like TC minus zero or TC minus two or so. So TC minus zero is seen here, or rather what we see here is the associated graded of some filtration on TC minus zero. So TC minus zero is somehow built from an infinite sequence of copies of R by some potentially complicated extensions. So how does the same thing look like for TP? Well, there's this Tate spectral sequence, and there the E2 page is not group cohomology, but Tate cohomology. So this is going to look like a periodic version of this. Where we have the picture from earlier, but then also this first quadrant is filled, right? So it's somehow periodic in that direction. And again, the total groups are going to be along these diagonals. So TP0, for example, is this uh, same extension that we saw over here. There's a map between those. There's always a map from homotopy fixed points to the Tate construction. It's called this the canonical map because in this picture it also does exactly what you think. It includes these dots into these. So in particular, we see here that TC minus zero and TC TP zero agree, for example, along this can map. Ah, let's uh, here. Ah, okay. 
that's good to keep in mind. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll have some colors uh, later, so that's, that will be good. All right, so uh, now, so one, one thing we can now wonder about What we can now wonder about is what is this extension here? And it turns out in the case of a perfect FP algebra, TC minus zero and TP zero, right? We've just agreed these, these agree, is actually kind of the most non-trivial extension you can build out of a bunch of copies of R, namely the VIT vectors. Right, so this somehow gives you even though you started with something that was p-torsion, bit vectors give you some lift of that to a torsion-free, complete ZP algebra. So this is going to be something that, if you reduce it modulo p, gives you back your R. So somehow, this extension is very non-trivial, and you can think of a generator here as being exactly p. So p is not zero in here. Instead, it's just this guy, and then uh, everything is p-torsion free, and uh, that's the bit vectors here. Right. So, but we can even say a bit more, still looking at this picture, namely, uh, remember this, this right-hand picture, that's kind of periodic in that direction, right? And so, if you take some uh, lift, <laughs> if you take some lift of that periodicity class down there in uh, in the lower row, you still get some periodicity class upstairs. So right, so we have that TP two i r is a invertible TP0 R module, right? So, so it is actually free of rank one, but somehow choosing a generator of it corresponds to choosing a lift of this periodicity class we have in Tate cohomology, and we can't do that canonically, right? So this is free of rank one, but only non-canonically. And, uh, what can we say about TC minus? Well, uh, we can also note that so this is like an independent observation. We can also recover TC minus 2i from TP 2i if we remember the filtration that you have from the spectral sequence, right? Somehow uh, on, the, on the thing your spectral sequence is computing, you have some filtration. And so if you look back to that picture, then what is T TC minus 2i? Well, it's just the filtration bigger equal four part of uh, sorry, I guess uh, I'm in degree four. So it's the filtration bigger equal four part of this, right? The it's just this stuff here. So let's also remember not just this TP0, the VIT vectors, and these invertible modules. Let's also remember uh, the filtration. So let me write, we can also recover TC minus 2i from TPi as the 2i stage of the filtration. And again, since this filtration is somehow only interesting at even steps, uh, we take like the double speed version. So write n bigger equal star on TP2i for the double speed. P 
filtration, then uh, two things hold. First of all, the filtration on our invertible module TP2I is base changed from the filtration on TP0, right? Because this whole picture is periodic. And second of all, uh, TC minus 2i gets identified with n bigger equal i of TP2i. Right? So all you need in order to remember all those groups is basically TP0 with this filtration and this invertible module, or these invertible modules, but these are really tensor powers of one another. So in, in principle, you only need to remember the module TP2. Right? TC minus is completely determined by this filtration. And now, oops. We have one more piece of structure in this picture. Right, so far we've talked about the uh, S1 action. That yeah, ah yeah, it's pretty. It's doing pretty good so far. But uh, so we have one more piece of structure, namely, uh, there also is a. Frobenius map from TC minus to TP. And this map somehow does not come from something you can generally do to HS1 and the Tate construction. Instead, it uses that THHR maps to THHR Tate CP and then on the Tate construction with respect to CP, right, this is like really the subgroup CP in S1, you get a residual action by S1 mod CP, but that's another copy of S1. And it turns out that map is equivariant and so we can just take homotopy fixed points everywhere. And now it's a little lemma that you can prove that at least up to P completion, if you first take Tate CP and then HS1, that's the same as just taking H, uh, Tate S1. Morally, because both of those are obtained by inverting the same element on group cohomology or like on, on homotopy fixed points instead of Tate. So this is really equivalent to this, at least up to P completion and in, in, in this R being a perfect FP algebra setting, this is already P complete, so let me drop that from notation. And so there is this map phi. And now that does something funny because it's not going to be compatible with this picture over there. Because see, we've not written TP here as Tate S1, but rather as this nested thing. And one can also draw a picture like this for that, but then one has to draw the homotopy fixed point spectral sequence of this outer HS1 here. And one can do that, and then the picture, this is where I'm saving time by not writing Rs and zeros everywhere. Uh, the picture is going to look like this. I have the homotopy fixed point spectral sequence here. And then I have a map to another homotopy fixed point spectral sequence, and that's the homotopy fixed point spectral sequence on THHR Tate CP here. And there uh, it turns out that THHR Tate CP is periodic in that direction. And so I get this kind of funny picture that's in these other two quadrants. But then again, we, we already know what this spectral sequence is computing. So this again has to be somehow the p adic filtration on the vit vectors. And so this element here is still just p, and this map has to send p to p. So this Frobenius 
up to maybe being like the Frobenius instead of the identity on some of these R's here. This Frobenius really also just takes these dots to these dots isomorphically. But it does, it, it looks different than, than what we had in the other picture, right? It, it somehow now takes this edge here to generators mod P. So if we drew this, if we looked at this, in this picture, it would not preserve the filtration, rather it would send these guys down over here, right? So it somehow tilts this down here. So, uh, let me erase this. That is true. Good idea. All right. For the recording, Jesper mentioned that I could also use the blackboards underneath. Um, right. So let's just observe here for posterity that somehow the Frobenius phi from Tc minus 2i to Tp 2i, and remember we wanted to write this all in terms of Tp, so this goes really from n bigger equal i Tp 2i to tp to i factors to an injective map from the ith graded of this filtration right that's exactly in the picture i just drew this rightmost column of this tc minus picture over to TP, modulo the filtration we see in this funny way of writing it, which is, uh, as I said, just the p-adic filtration. So let me write this as TP to I mod P over here. <laughs> All right. So most of what we saw here, we could actually phrase in terms of very little data. We had this uh, TP0, we had some filtration on there, we had some invertible modules over it, and then we had this Frobenius that somehow reduced this filtration, and we saw some more things that we'll see later in a, in a different shape. So, this is a very special situation, right? We've said this works for perfect FP algebras. In fact, one can generalize this a bit more, but uh, just think of prismatic cohomology as being an algebraic generalization of this picture and then most of the structure that shows up there will make more sense. So this is like the motivation for what I'm about to do and then uh, we're going to leave the world of uh, THH for now and we'll do some algebra. Yeah. Right, this right picture is supposed to be the homotopy fixed point spectral sequence for the S1 action that you have on THHR Tate CP. So this column here is given by the uh, homotopy groups of THHR Tate CP. And it's not obvious that they look like this, right? If, if, if you would make a naive guess, think of this as like FP adjoint uh, something in degree two. Tate cohomology gives you like even more stuff. It's, it's like surprising that this is so small. So if you compute this via the Tate spectral sequence, there's a lot of uh, differentials and so on. But it turns out that the homotopy groups of THHR Tate CP they look like uh, like 
a periodic version of the homotopy groups of THH itself in this, in this generality here. So that's a bit surprising, but then if you're willing to input that, then the homotopy fixed point spectral sequence again is given by looking at like group cohomology of S1 with coefficients in, in this, and then everything is even again, and uh, yeah. And this is another view on the same thing that we looked at over there, right? This also computes TP, just in an a priori different way. Ah, right, so this is a plus minus. Right. Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, I just said like this thing homotopy fixed points of the S1 action on THH Tate CP, that's equivalent by uh, something called the, the Tate orbit lemma or uh, something related to that, uh, to THH Tate S1, so TPR. So there's somehow two, two ways to write TP. One is to write it as THHR Tate S1. That's the way that's more closely related to this can map from TC minus to TP. And then there's this other way of writing it as homotopy fixed points of the S1 action on THH Tate CP, and that's the thing that's related to this Frobenius map. So we have two different ways of writing TP, and therefore there's like two, we have like there's like two different spectral sequences that converge to the same thing. Which comparison map? Um, I mean, there. I think if you think of Tate as being a natural transformation, uh, right, uh, sorry. If if you think of the norm as having some universal property, then what you want to do is you want to take the isomorphism that you always have, the, this equivalence that you always have for homotopy fixed points of homotopy fixed points and homotopy fixed points directly, compose it with the norm on the inside. Sorry, um, <coughs> what? Sorry, maybe I didn't understand Lior's question. Ah, yes. Ah, sorry. Yes. Uh, okay. Yes. So, right. There's a natural transformation from HS1 to, to this other guy, which goes through this equivalence of homotopy fixed points with respect to the residual action, followed by the canonical map to X Tate CP inside. And then I claim this also, like this identifies this guy with the, the P completion of uh, X Tate S1. Okay, so now let's leave this behind. And uh, so the idea is that prismatic cohomology is somehow going to abstract this kind of package of data that we saw uh, more algebraically. And one thing that we saw over here is that we had this weird Frobenius map, right? This is not uh, something like the Frobenius in uh, FP algebras. This is not 
just taking any element x to x to the p. That wouldn't be additive because as we saw earlier, these things in, in the case we looked at turned out to be vit vectors, so they're torsion free. So this is uh, this turns out to be something called a Frobenius lift and uh, let's make the following definition. So definition, a delta ring and here and always in my uh, later talks there's always going to be a fixed prime chosen. So all of this stuff here, also uh, TC which I didn't mention, uh, but this Frobenius here for example that's always with respect to a fixed prime and so let me just write here with respect to a fixed prime P uh, is a ring let's call it A together with a uh, map of sets delta from A to A this is not a homomorphism. Instead, it satisfies two other slightly funny looking rules with respect to addition and multiplication. The first is that it's additive up to some kind of cross effect correction term, which looks like the cross effect of pth power divided by p. Right, so what, what does this mean if I can't divide by p in A? Well, if you multiply this out, then all the coefficients are divisible by p. So there's like a polynomial in x and y that makes sense here with integer coefficients. That's the polynomial that appears there. And with respect to multiplication, it's almost looking like a derivation with respect to the pth power map, although that doesn't make sense, the pth power map is not a homomorphism, so there's also a correction term here, namely uh, p times delta x delta y. Right, so these are some weird algebraic rules, but uh, should be clear from that that, for example, you can compute delta of some polynomial in terms of delta of like the, the things this polynomial is built from by inductively applying these rules. So you can compute with this. Where are these coming from? So here's a way this like the, the way to remember these things. So these relations ensure that phi which I'm going to define as the pth power of x plus p times delta x is a ring endomorphism on A. Right, so in some sense this delta is the thing that you need to add to the pth power map in order to actually make it into a homomorphism. And oh, I still have one board. That's good. So, in fact, if A is P torsion free, this gives a bijection between delta ring structures on A and Frobenius lifts phi on A. And by Frobenius lift, I mean some ring homomorphism from A to A that lifts the Frobenius homomorphism that you have on A mod P. Why is that? 
Well, if if I give you phi, you can always get uh, a unique delta back by taking this difference and dividing it mod p uh, by p. Uh, this commutative diagram here ensures that you can divide by p, and p torsion freeness ensures that you can do this uniquely. And if you ever forget what these rules looked like, then you can just recover them by thinking about what multiplicativity and additivity means for phi and translate that back to this delta. Here are some examples. So, one thing I can do. Very good. All right. So, one example is I can take Z or ZP, these are P torsion free. And what is a uh, lift of Frobenius on there? Well, mod p, this is just fp. The Frobenius on fp is the identity. So I can take the identity as my Frobenius lift. Another example that uh, generalizes this is with vectors with phi being given by the width vector for Benios. And here I want R to be a perfect FP algebra. And in fact, so earlier you saw like TP of R uh, for a perfect FP algebra has like pi zero given by width vectors. And it turns out this cyclotomic Frobenius map that I mentioned is actually this. So we've seen this guy already under a different name. But you can also do other things. For example, you can take ZP adjoint a single polynomial variable and then produce a Frobenius lift on there by deciding, well, I can't have this take any like every element to its pth power, but I can do so on the polynomial generator that defines a well-defined endomorphism of this. And uh, you can, of course, also combine two and three. You can like take like with vectors, add joint one or more polynomial variables. So these are different examples of delta rings. Based on that. Let us define what a prism is. So a prism is a delta ring A together with an ideal in A such that two things hold. First, uh, I is an invertible A module and A is P comma I complete. And another way to say that I'm an invertible A module is that locally in the Zariski topology on A, I'm really a free module. So this should be like a locally principal ideal. And then another way, like if you're if you're in this principal situation, then another way of saying this is of course being complete with respect to P and the generator of this. And in fact, most of the prisms we'll look at will actually have the property that this is already uh, a principal ideal. And secondly, uh, I is locally 
generated by a distinguished element meaning this is an element D such that delta of D is a unit. There's another way to kind of more intrinsically say uh, condition two equivalently, but I think this is uh, a bit easier to, to think about in general. So again, we look at some examples. So what I could do is I could take ZP with the ideal P, right? I am P complete, and you can check that delta of P is a unit in the PLX. For example, by writing it in terms of the Frobenius lift as we did over there. Similarly, you can also do this fit vector example with this element P. And maybe to vary the third example we had, you can do this ZP adjoint Z, but then take some interesting polynomial. Let's take maybe Z plus P. You can check that delta of this is also a unit. If I want to be complete with respect to P and to this, I need to take power series but that still has a delta ring structure as described over there, and then this is also a prism. And in fact, you can take any Eisenstein polynomial. So instead of Z plus P, um, that's a nice little exercise to compute that delta of those as a unit. And so we can make a nice little table of uh, what A mod I looks like for different prisms like this. So if you take a perfect prism with I being given by the uh, ideal generated by P, so that's what's called a crystalline, so if the ideal is generated by P, we call this a crystalline prism. So uh, perfect and crystalline. Then A mod I is uh, a perfect FP algebra. Ah, sorry. And uh, I haven't told you when we call a prism perfect. A prism is perfect if its Frobenius lift is uh, an automorphism, right? I mean, this makes, makes this doesn't use the prism structure. It's just a, a delta ring is perfect if its Frobenius lift is an automorphism. And so, perfect prisms give you perfect FP algebras. And the other way around, the inverse to this construction is with vectors. And if you drop the condition of uh, on on the ideal, you just take any perfect prism, then a mod i could be a perfect FP algebra, but could also be something more general. So what you get in this case are so-called perfectoid rings. And so this is one nice way to actually define what perfectoid rings are, because you can rather explicitly write down the inverse construction here. This is like vit vectors of the tilt. And then uh, perfectoid rings are exactly corresponding to perfect prisms on that side. So uh, this was one of the sources for this notion of prisms. Uh, but we also have more general things like this. And let me put here prisms where the underlying delta ring is of the form WK adjoint Z. And then we could have some Eisenstein polynomial 
as ideal, then if you quotient by this ideal, you'll get something that's a discrete valuation ring, sorry, complete discrete valuation ring with residue field P, uh, K and chosen uniformizer, right? Uh, if you have like a chosen element generator Z here, you get some chosen element there. And this is also a bijective correspondence. If you take some discrete valuation ring with residue field K, some uh, p adic like for perfect k, so some kind of p adic number ring. Then, uh, after you've chosen a uniformizer, you you can recover such a prism. Um, yes, but. Uh, Yes, so, uh, I mean, there is not even a Frobenius on the perfectoid ring itself, right? So, th th so th th there's a question about what perfectoid, uh, how, that, how that corresponds here. The, the point is that out of a perfectoid ring, you can extract a perfect FP algebra by forming the tilt, right? The Frobenius on the perfectoid ring is not a uh, bijection or anything, but you can extract out of a perfectoid ring a perfect FP algebra and then take its bit vectors. And if you also remember a certain ideal on that, then this construction is actually uh, an equivalence. That's uh, what's suggested here. So we have this notion of prisms, which are somehow morally rings with a Frobenius lift and a certain type of ideal. And now we are ready to define prismatic cohomology. So given a prism, a comma i and an a mod i algebra are the prismatic site prism r over a is uh, the category or rather, I guess, the opposite of the category whose objects are prisms B comma J with a diagram like this. I have a map from A down to R, which goes through A mod I have a map over here, B mod J, and then I have a map upstairs here, and we require this to be a map of prisms. So this needs to be a map of delta rings taking I into J, and what you'll notice is that that's automatic from commutativity, because somehow uh, I is contained in the kernel of the vertical map here, and uh, therefore needs to go into the kernel here. So it really suffices to ask for this to be a map of delta rings. So these are the objects in my site. My site is the opposite of that. 
and then uh, if I want to talk about sheaves on that, I need to provide some topology, and we're just going to call a map b to uh, b prime a cover if b to b prime is uh, fully faithful. I guess, uh, sorry, faithfully flat. <laughs> faithfully flat, and there I, I need to, of course, uh, be uh, say that in the complete sense, right? Uh, I want to look at uh, p comma i complete things, so I should say p complete p comma i completely faithfully flat, and then. It means that uh, if you base change and then p comma i complete, that that composition is exact, and that so that's flat, and uh, faithful should mean something like. Yes, I guess that also works. So, yeah, let's not worry about the details. Um, someone suggested that it uh, this could be checked modulo p comma i, and I th think that's true. But maybe you have to reduce in a derived way. Um, so. Yes, I guess I also was a bit sloppy with this condition of bounded p torsion. I think that's related to the subtleties regarding derived versus underived p completion. Let's also not worry about that. So I also don't want to worry about that, but uh <laughs> everything should be good if you derive enough or add enough conditions. So on this on this uh, site we have a sheaf. So on prism R over A we have a sheaf O sub prism R relative A, which takes an object B comma J just to B. And this somehow comes, of course, also, we, we also have this ideal, so we could also look at sheaves that take this uh, ideal to itself. Maybe, uh, maybe let me do like a funny i or j for that. And then we also have uh, sorry, taking this to j. And then we also have, of course, something that just remembers the uh, mod uh, J reduction, right? I can take B comma J just to B mod J. And now that these are sheaves follows basically from a complete version of a faithfully flat descent. And now prismatic cohomology just defined as global sections of this guy. So prismatic cohomology of the pair R relative A is derived global sections of this sheaf. And since I'm 
more comfortable with this than with sheaf cohomology, you can also write this as taking a limit over all of the objects of your site of just evaluating the sheaf there. And similarly, we're going to define uh, like the like some some kind of reduced version as global sections of this. Yeah. Ah, that's a derived limit. Yes, sorry. So this limit in, I guess, uh, derived A modules. Good point, yes. So I realize that uh, I'm basically out of time. So let me finish with one little example, which is kind of a bit trivial, but already maybe uh, illustrates what this could do for us in general. So if you take R equals to A mod I, right, the, the initial A mod I algebra, then this site has an initial object, right? You can just take A and A mod I itself, right? That's a prism. You can take the horizontal maps to be the identity. So then prism R relative A has an initial object, A comma I. And therefore, prismatic cohomology of A mod I relative A is just A. And this prism bar guy is A mod I. So somehow, I mean, that's now a bit of a weak statement because we have somehow input A, but somehow prismatic cohomology turns A mod I into A itself. And if we plug in some other A mod I algebra, it maybe also produces something that's more like a torsion-free A module or so. We'll see uh, what exactly it does in the next lecture. But here's some hope that this maybe does the same kind of thing that TP did in this very restricted situation, that it somehow took a characteristic P thing and blew it up to something P torsion-free. So let me stop here. Thank you very much. Uh, any questions? Yeah. Right. So uh, Shaha was asking whether, like, what what about the filtration that we saw on TP? So. A lot of the structure that we saw on TP we'll only uh, see on prismatic cohomology a bit later because some of these things are a bit subtle, but we will of course see uh, this filtration N uh, appear and also uh, these invertible modules uh, TP2I. So I guess I also haven't told you yet how this exactly relates back to TP, but uh, this will become clearer in, in a later talk. Well, that's uh, also what we will talk about in later talks. So the question was how computable this is. And I guess so far we've only been very lucky in this one case where there's like an, an initial object, right? <laughs> uh, we will see in the next talk that there's somehow slightly bigger generality in which this site still has an initial object. And I guess so far this initial object I argument over there hasn't even used delta ring structures, right? If I, if I hadn't asked for this upper map to be a map of delta rings, 
this category would still have an initial object. But we'll see later that in slightly more general examples, uh, this delta ring structure up there makes this just rigid enough that uh, very often this prismatic cohomology has a nice description as really like something discrete. And then the cases in which it is not discrete uh, can be computed through that. So I will, this, this will be one of the main goals this week uh, of my lectures that we will see how to compute this explicitly uh, in some examples. question was whether PP2I admits some canonical description as module over the vid vectors. There's some cheap answer I could give in terms of uh, the, the corresponding structure on prismatic cohomology. It might be true that there is a way to trivialize that in this case. But is there a preferred generator? Or okay, so there seems to be a canonical description. It's enough to do this for FP, right? Because then the others uh, turn out to be base changed from that. Uh, yeah, maybe we can talk about that also in a later talk. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, ah, yeah, that's a very nice question. So the question was, why the hell? Uh, so let me rephrase that question. <laughs> Namely, back when I learned what this meant, it somehow had to involve the notion of sheaves, i.e. the topology. And the right-hand side doesn't look like it does that. Um, so the reason is that if you give me a general sheave, on this site, then this formula is not always true. What you have to do first instead is to replace your ordinary sheaf by its derived sheafification, right? If I give you some ordinary sheaf of abelian groups on some site, I can always view this as taking values in the derived category of abelian groups. But then it might not satisfy the sheaf condition anymore, but you can again sheafify it in there. And then it turns out sheaf cohomology, if you do this for some small site, is given as global sections of the resulting uh, derived sheafification. So here we don't really have global sections. We don't have an initial, sorry, on the site terminal object to evaluate it on. That's why this limit appears here instead. But this only works because in fact, this sheaf is already a derived sheaf. Otherwise, I would here need to put the values of the derived sheafification instead. Why does that work? Well, that's because faithfully flat descent is really like a derived statement. But yes, that's a good point. That's why somehow the right-hand side doesn't use the topology, because the topology only enters when you derive sheafify and not when you actually evaluate, take global sections. This is just taking global sections in a sense. Yeah? Mm -hmm. In some so the question was this kind of table that I drew, where we somehow had prisms on the left and certain kinds of rings on the right, whether there's a, a general way of saying... 
okay, of how to go from the right to the left. So whether for a given ring there's some kind of initial way to lift it to a prism. In a sense, that's exactly what prismatic cohomology does, right? If you, if you look at the definition of this uh, prismatic site again, there we're basically taking all the ways to map from R into something like a mod J reduction of some prism. If there was some way to actually lift R to a prism, then it would at least be like a weakly initial object in that category. Uh, in general, we ha just have like we can't make a single such choice, we have to take a limit over all of those. Uh, but it turns out that uh, therefore this, this functor from the right to the left that I described explicitly sometimes as vid vector, sometimes as something else, you can always think of that as taking prismatic cohomology relative to some reasonable base prism. So uh, there is a way to pass to like an initial prism in a sense, it's prismatic cohomology, just that only for very special rings, this actually gives you a prism, right? It's usually some limit of prisms, and yeah, you could try and say derived prism, but uh, it's a bit tricky. There was a comment, uh, just for the recording, that uh, there is a way to say derived prism in such a way that this is really the derived, like the initial object in derived prisms with a map from R to the reduction. I think you have to be a little bit careful, for example, though, because this, this I is not always going to, like in this derived situation, this I is not going to be an invertible module always. So think there is some notion of derived prism, but it's you have to remember more than an ideal, I think. At some point we have to, yeah. Yeah. If not, uh, let's uh, thank the speaker again.